Okay, this video is for my A-level electronics students and uh, it's all about uh, this circuit and how I've got some assembly code running so I can, uh, rather than using polling, repeatedly checking the value of switch input, I can get um, a change in value to interrupt the code and then to execute some uh, other code, interrupt service routine code. So let's just switch the whole circuit off switch it back on you'll see that I've got code or you can assume, or you can imagine that I've got code which is just toggling this on and off that's in an endless loop and then uh, when I press this switch the interrupt service routine runs so whatever was happening at the time is interrupted it runs some code and that interrupt service routine includes codes turn that on and then when I press that switch again the interrupt service routine ran again and then toggled the value of, of that LED so I can repeatedly do that. The advantage of having an interrupt service routine rather than say um, polling, let's let's imagine that this LED was just going on and off at like 10 second interval so like um, goes on and then like a, a 10 second delay routine or something. Well during those 10 seconds of delay you're going to probably be in a loop and you don't really want to constantly be checking whether that switch is pressed. Far easier just to have a, a loop to waste 10 seconds and then at any point in that, if the switch is pressed, have the, that then fire an, inter, an interrupt service routine. Right, okay, so um, very quickly, just quickly looking at the ball then. So uh, my switch input is on RB0, which is slash int. Let's have a quick look at the data sheet. So RB0 int, so I'm going to configure that as an input, and then these are RB1, RB2, the two LEDs, and then RB3, the buzzer. I'm not actually using the buzzer in this video because it's just going to get annoying. So I'm going to configure this one as uh, input. I'm going to configure these three as outputs. I'm also going to have to write some code called an ISR interrupt service routine to handle the switch presses on that. Okay, let's have a look at some code. You notice I've got some annotations because I just started recording, or I thought I was recording video. I was talking for about 10 minutes and I realised I hadn't pressed the uh, start button. So, uh, excuse the annotations, uh, they were made from what I was doing previously. Anyway, so this is my code. It runs to about three pages. It's, it's fairly long because it's written in assembly and also I've got a lot of comments in now. I'm sure I could have made it a lot more concise if I wanted to. So, um, yeah, so I'm using a PIC16F84A, so I specify that processor. I do uh, include the header file for it, set the configuration bits, normal sort of thing. And then I then specify um, a code block at memory address 0. So that's an important address because that address is when you turn on the PIC chip, the program counter is uh, set to um, 0. And then so whatever code is at zero is going to be executed. So basically the go to start instruction is at memory address zero. So I turn the pick on, it runs that instruction. Now remember start is just a label. You could call it anything, you could call it main or, or whatever, but I've called it start. So start is there. And so this is my um, block of code here with the label of start. And then, so it's first of all going to call the initialization routine, which I've defined elsewhere. Uh, I then call flash LED subroutine, which I've defined up here, that one. Uh, and then I'm going to go to dollar minus one. Uh, in other words, dollar is the current value of the program counter, minus one is so the previous instruction, so it's just going to repeatedly um, loop around. Here, okay, so it's just going to repeatedly flash LED. If you have a look at the uh, flash LED code, you'll see it just turns the LED on and off, and it's just got a delay of 500 milliseconds uh, between each on and off state. So there's, there's no checking of switch input there, but of course, like I say, when you press the switch, yeah, it's definitely responding to the switch. So, so clearly, if we're stuck in a loop just doing the flashing LED, there must be something happening elsewhere. And that's the interrupt code, which is actually going to be handling that interrupt event. So, 
uh, if you go back to the start of the code or close to the start of the code you'll see that yeah we put the code for the uh, reset vector at zero there and then 04 that's the interrupt uh, vector address so if an interrupt occurs the program counter goes to memory address 4. Now there are f on the PIC16F84A there are four different sources of interrupts um, on our example, we're only interested in the external interrupt on RB0 slash int pin. There are other ones. I'm going to ignore those for the moment. Okay, they are actually quite useful, um, but for the moment we're going to ignore them. But what you have to bear in mind is that when an interrupt occurs, it could be any one of the four. So we need to determine in our interrupt service routine the code we write to service the, the um, interrupt we need to determine whether it's the interrupt that we're interested in or whether it's one of the others. Now, let's say that an interrupt has occurred. So program counters changed to 4 and at that address we've got an instruction to go to the My ISR label. So we jump to My ISR. All of this is comments here. And then the first thing I'm doing here is I'm going to do a bit test file. So I'm going to test a bit of the intcon uh, register and I'm going to uh, skip the next line if set. So I'm going to test a bit of this register. Now the bit that I want to test is the int f register. Now if you look in the data sheet you'll find the intcon register is described in quite some detail here and the and bit one of the intcon register uh, which we can refer to as int f is the external interrupt um, flag bit so if bit one is which is that one if bit one has a value of one then the external interrupt occurred if it's zero it wasn't an external interrupt so in other words, at this point, if we check whether the, if int f is 1, then we know it was an external interrupt. If it wasn't 1, well, we know that there was an interrupt because we're in the ISR. It must have been one of the other three. If it's one of the other three, um, then we're not going to skip uh, the next line because bit test file skip if set so only if it's set will it skip the next line so if it's not set it must be like a timer overflow interrupt or an interrupt on change or an EEPROM write complete interrupt so it's going to do this uh, instruction here now um, you're probably familiar or you will be familiar with using the return uh, instruction in assembly uh, return just uh, returns to you, you do a call and then you return um, however um, ret -fi -e, however you pronounce it R -E -T -F -I -E, um, does works in a similar way to return but as well as returning to wherever the code was before it also clears the global interrupt enable bit which needs a bit of explanation as soon as um, the interrupt has occurred so let's say that an interrupt occurred so now we're executing the ISR um, the um, global interrupt enable bit will be set to zero so as soon as an interrupt occurred it then disables all further interrupts and um, if you then did a return but you didn't uh, set the global interrupt enable bit then you wouldn't have any future interrupts handled. So you can't just return, you actually need to return and enable the global interrupt enable bit. So to do that, use that command. Right, okay, now assuming that um, the intcon int f um, bit was set, then it must, then that signifies that there was an external interrupt. So then you can run whatever the code is that you want to run. Now, uh, in just two lines, uh, I have written code which is going to uh, complement the value of that. So if it's current zero, it's going to change to one. If it's one, it's going to go to zero, logic one, logic zero. 
Um, if you don't understand what that does, you have to figure that one out because I want to concentrate more on interrupts than how I've used um, exclusive all. Okay, now, so after you're doing the code, now you could have run to a few lines. It's, it's normal to, ke to keep your ISR really quite brief uh, because you don't want it to affect timing, you don't want it to affect other th potential sources of interrupts, L lots of reasons. You normally ISR is going to be brief. So I've got a very brief uh, bit of code for my ISR there. It's just going to flip the value of that LED. So having done that, I'm now more or less ready to return to whatever code was running, which is going to be the LED flashing. So um, what I need to do before I return using Repfy, I need to clear the int f flag. Now the int f flag is the external interrupt flag bit. So remember that when an external interrupt happens, um, the external interrupt flag bit is set to 1. So that's the way programmatically we can check which of the events had happened. You need to clear that. If you don't clear it and then you, you, you uh, use the rectify command, as soon as you've returned, the, the flag has, is still set. And if the flag is set to 1 and external interrupt occurs, you're going to go straight back into the ISR. You've got to clear it. If you don't clear it, you're going to have problems. So clear it and then do a rectify E. Um, hopefully that's reasonably straightforward. So that's the interrupt service routine. That's just some delay code. I'll use Kolovchenko website to make it. The initialization routine is, is super important. So uh, if you remember when we did a go to when we did a go to the start label, we called the initialization routine. So in my initialization routine, I first of all want to configure my input, configure my outputs by modifying the tri-state registers. I then want to clear all those values because I want the you know both LEDs to be off and I want the buzzer to be off, so I do that. And then I have a delay. The delay is perhaps not intuitive. Now I just use delay 500 milliseconds because I had a delay 500 milliseconds routine. It's a little bit long. You don't need it to be that long. However, it's just convenient for me. The reason for that is that I'm going to have my interrupt. Um, um, have my interrupt so that when the RB0 goes low the interrupt event occurs so it's going to be a falling edge interrupt. Now uh, the issue with that is that um, I'm debouncing the interrupt of uh, on pin RB0. I'm debouncing it with a capacitor and a couple of resistors so if let's say you assume that the circuit's been off for a while the capacitor is fully discharged you flip the power back on, circuit starts up, PIC starts running its code. Perhaps before the capacitor is fully charged, then it's going to be a low value on RB0. So then the interrupt runs, but you never press the switch. But it's like the switch was pressed because this switch is going to be taking that pin low because I've got a pull-up resistor. So to avoid all those problems, you want to have this capacitor charged up. And just to give that capacitor time to charge up, I've just added a short delay. It could be much shorter than 500 milliseconds, that's a bit excessive, but as I say, it just made the code easy. So having uh, allowed that capacitor to charge up, I then um, go to um, bank 1. Now I need to go to bank 1 because that's the option route, so let me just find a memory map. you'll see that the option register is in bank 1. Okay. The intcon register, interestingly, is in both uh, bank 0 and bank 1. The option register is only in bank 1, so be careful on that. 
So I'm going to bits at file status rp0, so I've gone into bank 1. I know there are better ways, but that's the way the exam would like you to do it, so that's the way we do it. And then bit clear file, option, reg, int, edge. Now, let's have a look if I can find some stuff for that. There we go. So the option register, uh, bit 6 of the option register, um, you can use, you can set, um, if you set it to 1, then the, the interrupt will happen for the external interrupt on the rising edge, or if you clear it, then it will be on the falling edge. Well, I want my uh, interrupt to happen on the falling edge, because when I press that switch, it's... Um, takes the uh, input value down to logic low. So um, I'm clearing the uh, int edge bit of the option register. And then what I do, the int con register. Remember, as I said earlier, the int con register is in both bank 0 or bank 1, so it doesn't matter. You do it however you like. So um, int con register int f. Now int f, let's have a look at the int con register. So int f is the external interrupt flag bit, so I want to just clear that, so I want to make sure that there is no uh, interrupt flag set. Um, int con int e int e, external interrupt enable bit, so I want to enable the external interrupt, so I want to set that bit, so 1, so I need to set that bit or, um, to 1, and then bit set file int con g i e, when I set that bit, bit 7, I'm therefore enabling all unmasked interrupts, an unmasked interrupt is one that you've enabled, so like for example I've enabled the external interrupt enable bit, but then I still need to then glo um, enable the global interrupt enable bit, which will enable anything that's unmasked, including the one that I unmasked earlier. And then I return. Now that's the uh, init subroutine. So, largely speaking, that all works quite well. Uh, in fact, it does work well. I mean, there's, there's, there's no issue. It works, it works absolutely fine. However, there is something that I need to warn you about. That uh, To keep this quite simple, I haven't added it in. Um, as, as you're aware, um, in my interrupt service routine, or as you're probably aware, in my interrupt service routine, I am modifying the value of the working file register. But just, just imagine the implications for that in your code if in your code, let's say you've got complex program running and you're just about to do a calculation, so you load a value into the working file register, and then someone presses the button. So press the button, interrupt service routine then runs, and now you've modified the contents of the working file register, does its staff, and then returns to do the calculation that you were doing before, but but now in the working file register, it's not the value we had before. It's it's this new value that I just put in the working file register. That can cause you a major problem. So, um, if you're going to modify the working file register, the thing that you should be doing at the start of your ISR is to save whatever the current value of the working register is into, say, a temporary uh, variable, and then. You can then do whatever you like with the working file register, and then just at the end, before you return, then you need to copy that value back into the working file register. That is super, super important. I've not included it in this code, but that is something you most definitely need to do in your own code. And we'll probably be doing that as a class activity, so we'll be modifying this code. Okay, I know that's a long video. I know that probably most people turned off after a minute. Um, however, um, if you did make it through, um, well done. Okay, and uh, I'll be seeing you in class. Okay, thanks very much. Goodbye.